uh, I'd like to begin by, before I introduce Ron Gabriel, uh, to thank the many members of the Historical Society who made a donation to support uh, Quitman House and Palatine Farmstead's effort to put a new porch, uh, a, to, to restore the porch in effect, uh, that will be reappearing in front of the Palatine Farmstead on Route 9. Uh, and if anyone hasn't made a donation here and would like to do so, the address, the, the checks would be payable to Nancy's in the back of the room there, Quitman Resource Center, P.O. Box. QRC slash KT Verilli Memorial. Yeah. And um, uh, then the post office box is 624. P.O. Box 624, Rhinebeck, New York, yeah. 12572. Okay, great. The um, <coughs> next month, we will not be meeting here. We will be meeting on Friday, October 25th at the Morton Memorial Library in Rhinecliff. Uh, your speaker that evening will be none other than myself, talking about the history of Ellerslie. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I hope uh, some of you are as well. Uh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that many of you know that we're in this room, uh, a number of us doing a variety of things related to local history, using the collections in the archives room, and we could benefit from having some additional volunteers. And if anyone's uh, got some time available, an hour or two on a Thursday between 10 and 3, we're here year-round. Uh, so get in touch with us, let me know. Um, so now I would like to uh, get to the reason that everybody's here this evening, namely to hear uh, Ron Gabriel talk about war dogs. Ron uh, began his career in Kingston, taught there for, I think it was about uh, 10 years, uh, and uh, coached in Kingston. Uh, then he went up to Columbia Green Community College and was, the, uh, was a phys ed teacher for some 28 years, athletic director there, and <clears throat> subsequent to that, or maybe in tandem with that, uh, I know he was involved uh, in the radio. Uh, he, he was a radio announcer for a couple of radio stations in the Kingston and Hudson or Catskill area, I believe. Yeah. Uh, WGHQ, some of you may be familiar with the, that radio station and may have listened to some football games on WHQ, WGHQ. Um, and he has appeared here. This will be his third uh, visit with us. Some of you may have been here uh, or in the other room for the Lionel Train uh, talk and uh, then there was another uh, talk old that, on yep. old time radio yep. that you did for us Ron and that was uh, that actually has been one of our mo I think there have been some 1600 hits on the uh, on the YouTube uh, of that particular presentation. So we're delighted to have you this evening, uh, and Ron is going to talk about war dogs. Well, thank you. Welcome. Uh, nothing at all to do with war dogs, but Mike intrigued me here. Uh, WGHQ, would anybody remember the original call letters of WGHQ? I hope it rings a bell. It was originally WSKN Saugerties, and then they moved their studios down in Kingston and it became WGH2. And the, the guy that owned the station was a bombastic guy named Harry Thayer. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Remember Harry Thayer? Yeah. Oh, and, and in real life, I assure you, he was every bit as bombastic and, and controversial uh, as, as he came across on the air. He was, he was one of a kind, no doubt about mm -hmm. that. Well, anyway, uh, any other dog lovers in here? I, I'm, I'm hopefully many. Uh, and the history of dogs on the battlefield is a long and heroic one. As far back as 4000 BC, the Egyptians used dogs for military purposes. In the Middle Ages, dogs were trained to run into the enemy's encampment with fire on its back, shake off the fire, and then scoot out of there 
to avoid the inevitable scorching that would follow. I've never been able to figure out what the mechanism was that they used to, you know, to, so yeah. that the dog didn't burn his own back, but they had some sort of a cradle or something that, that was used for that. The first use <clears throat> of American war dogs takes place during the Seminole Indian Wars in the 1830s and the 1840s. During the Civil War, dogs are used as guard dogs, mascots, and messengers. But neither the Union nor the Confederacy had any official policy on the use of war dogs. Dogs used in the Civil War were mostly dogs that were brought from home by the soldiers on either side and then put to military use. And in line with that, then, I have a Civil War dog story for you. The Battle of Shiloh takes place April 6th and 7th, 1862, in Hardin County, H-A-R-D-I-N, Hardin County in southwestern Tennessee. Shiloh will be the bloodiest battle of the Civil War up to that point. The two sides will suffer a total of 23,600. And 46 casualties. One of those casualties is a Lieutenant Lewis Peff, P F E F F, of the 3rd Illinois Infantry. Two weeks after the battle, Lieutenant Peff's widow comes to the battlefield in an effort to secure his body and bring it back to Illinois for a proper burial. She scours the battlefield for the better part of the day with no luck. Late in the afternoon, she's out in a remote part of the field. And as she looks out into the distance, she notices an object and it's moving in her direction. As the object gets closer, she realizes it's a dog. And as the dog gets closer yet, she realizes it's her dog and her husband's dog. The dog runs up to her, they have a reunion, and after a while the dog breaks free and heads back out into the direction from where it had come. Halfway out in the field, the dog stops, turns, looks at Mrs. Peff, and he seems to nod his head at her as if to say, follow me. <laughs> and she does. And sure enough, that dog will lead her directly to her husband's grave. Later, when Mrs. Peff is speaking with members of her husband's unit, they will tell her that that dog laid on top of her husband's grave for 12 consecutive days. I ask you, is there anything more loyal on planet Earth than the dog? And it is then that loyalty combined with the natural senses of smell, hearing, and night vision that makes the dog the ideal candidate for the protection of troops around itself. Bear with me now, a little, little bit of science. The human nose has 40 million olfactory receptors. The dog's nose, 2 billion <laughs> olfactory receptors. This means the dog can smell out objects about 100 times better than we can. The human ear can hear at about a rate of 20,000 hertz per second. The dog hears at a rate of 35,000 hertz per second. In fact, the dog can hear footsteps right in front of itself while a jet fighter is taking off next to him. And the reason he could do that is because the dog has the ability to close off the inner ear and focus only on sounds directly in front of himself. And in terms of night vision, the dog's eye is built to see at night. It has a wider pupil to allow the entrance of all available ambient light, ambient light being the light of the stars and the moon. In addition to that, the rods and the cones in the dog's eye boost that natural illumination. So, it's that natural sensory perfection that seems to make the dog clairvoyant or to possess a sixth sense, military dog or otherwise. I know we've all seen this with our own dogs at home. There are times it's, how do they know that? You know, they're, they're, they're amazing creatures. Well, in America's military today, dogs act in a variety of capacities. There are patrol dogs, scout dogs, tracking dogs, narcotics detection dogs, cadaver dogs, comfort dogs, and therapy dogs. And the number one use of America's war dogs in Iraq and Afghanistan has been in 
explosives detection. The terrorists love to plant these homemade bombs everywhere. They call them improvised explosive devices or IEDs. I'm sure you've heard of them. <clears throat> and yes, these bombs may uh, kill or maim an American military member, which is what the terrorists want, but they're just as likely to kill or maim an indigenous civilian. So every time one of our war dogs smells out one of those bombs, he's saving not only American lives and limbs, but native civilian lives and limbs as well. Now, I regretfully have to report to you that the American military today no longer uses the term war dogs. The new term is military working dogs, or MWDs. And I'm wondering if anybody else in here uh, realizes just how complicated our language has become. We've lost the ability to say anything simply anymore. And I'm also wondering if anyone has purchased the military working dog stamps that are out right now. At least, we, right Arlene, we have a set of them right now in the post office. Every, I think every month or two they come out with a, with, and that's what, in fact, I think I bought ours over in Red Book, the military working dog stamps. But that's the new term. MWDs. But for our purposes, I'm going to continue to say war dogs or military dogs, and I think we know what we're talking about. Now, America's military today has some preferences. And I don't know if you've picked out, you've heard me referring to the dogs in the male gender. That's because the military prefers male dogs. And when I say that, once in a while a lady in the audience goes, yeah, for the aggression. <laughs> <laughs> but they also prefer that the dogs weigh no more than about 70 pounds. And when I start passing out the photographs, I think you'll see why. And they like three particular breeds. They like, and, and uh, as always, I'm going to be passing these photos around, so if you wouldn't mind taking a peek and, and uh, both sides and then work it on around. But anyway, they like the Belgian Malinois. That's become a big uh, dog today. They like the Dutch Shepherd. And folks, this Dutch Shepherd is wearing a pair of doggles. Not goggles, doggles. Okay, very important. They're doggles, okay. And of course, always and ever, they like the Police. German Shepherd, a German police dog, and this German Shepherd is wearing a pair of booties to protect his paws from the burning sands of Iraq and the burning snows of Afghanistan. And on the back of this photo, you're going to see why they like the dogs to be not much more than 70 pounds. Okay. Sometimes the dog is fatigued or wounded, and it's just so much easier for his handler uh, to carry him, and he will. That handler will carry him to the ends of the earth if necessary. Finally, <clears throat> this beautiful German Shepherd is recovering from PTSD, which demonstrates so clearly that the horrors of war affect animals every bit as they do the humans. Um, off at Air Force Base, the Air Force is very, very much involved uh, in dog handling and dog training. And off at Air Force Base out in Omaha, Nebraska is the site of a lot of these uh, training programs. Now, one Air Force, talking about Air Force, one Air Force dog handler says, it is the level of comfort that the dog brings to the unit he's with that simply otherwise would not be there. In other words, members of the unit feel like they have so much of a better chance to not be blown to smithereens by that bomb or to be caught in an ambush because of the presence of the dog. He sums it up by saying, simply put, the presence of a dog with a unit saves lives. Wow. But my favorite is the second uh, Air Force dog handler. In one sentence, this Air Force dog handler says it better than all the words of this speech. He says, there is not on planet Earth, a piece of equipment that can do what a dog does. 
And finally, an Air Force kennel master says, it must be remembered that the training and the missions of the military dog have to be kept in an atmosphere of fun. For you see, to the dog, this is all a game. He knows that if he smells out that bomb, he's going to receive a reward. Now, it may be food, but generally in combat situations, they tend to shy away from food as a reward. More often, it'll be heaps of verbal praise, a boy, a boy, or it might be a nice brisk rub down, or their favorite reward of all, a few minutes to chew on their Kong toy. They love their Kong toy. Okay. Now, in America today, we have, of course, the military dog, the military working dog, and so many police agencies across the nation have canine units, the Dutchess County Sheriff, Ulster County, even Greene County, our little county where we live. And <clears throat> the similarities are quite interesting, that the police dog and the military dog are required to do very similar things and demonstrate proficiencies in similar things. For instance, both the police dog and the military dog must be comfortable mingling in with a crowd until one of three conditions. Until the dog is provoked by a suspicious person, or until he is commanded by the handler. And the third one requires no command at all. If ever the handler is assaulted, the dog will respond automatically to protect the handler. And I have to share with you I've never quite understood the mindset of someone who would attack a police dog or military dog handler. When I know, for instance, that that German Shepherd exerts a bite force of up to 750 pounds <coughs> per square inch. Or, to put it a different way, with one snap of his jaw, the German Shepherd can break six bones in the back of your hand and your wrist. Why would anybody mess with such a fearsome weapon as something I've never quite understood? Other things that both the police dog and the military dog have to do, they've got to be able to detect the presence of people at various distances by sight, by sound, by smell. Uh, both dogs must demonstrate proficiency in pursuit, attack, and here's the one nobody thinks of. Release. It will do little good if the dog is not disciplined enough to stop making meatloaf out of the bad guy on command. So they've got to be able to be disciplined enough to stop the attack or whatever the, the situation that the handler demands. And then lastly, both the police dog and the military dog have to be able to ride in a vehicle comfortably. Again, three conditions until provoked, commanded, or again if the handler should ever be attacked. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to take a look at the role of America's war dogs in our more modern wars, starting with World War I. In World War I, the war to end all wars, the United <coughs> States of America is the only major combatant power to make absolutely no official use of war dogs. The reason generally given is, well, we got in the war a little late, April 6th, 1917, and the war was over fairly quickly. Remember the legend of the 11s we were taught in school? At the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Remember that? The old time teachers used to teach, I don't know what they're teaching today, but, but anyway, that was the legend of the 11s. And uh, so that was the reason given. We, we really didn't have time to ramp up dog training programs. Closer to the truth is the fact that just like in the Civil War, the American High Command had little to no faith in the use of war dogs. They just couldn't see a path for using war dogs. Now, that was not true of our major opponent, Germany. Germany will utilize over 30,000 war dogs during the course of World War I. In fact, when the war broke out July 20th, 1914, Germany had 6,000 war dogs trained and ready to go. Germany has always been a big believer in the use of war dogs. They have the first nation on earth to build a war dog training facility way back in 1884, just outside of Berlin. 
Now, having said that, I do actually have two dog stories that come out of World War I. One is about, let's say, a semi-official war dog by the name of Sergeant Stubby. Okay? And there's Stubby with his medals, and here he's uh, the Grand Marshal of a parade. And it's a, he's even got his own little gas mask. <laughs> and the other dog story that comes out of World War I is about a dog that is not a war dog at all, but becomes arguably, and I'm going to let you guess, becomes arguably the most famous dog in American history. And I'm going to leave that on the table. Unfortunately, I don't have time in this speech to tell those two stories. But if ever you would like me to come back and, and give the speech on war dog, I'm sorry, dog stories of World War I, I would tell you about Sergeant Stubby and about the arguably most famous dog in American history. In World War II, at the time of Pearl Harbor, we have less than 100 dogs in military service. And mostly they have only one mission, and that is to go out into remote areas where vehicles can't go, primarily snowy areas, to rescue stranded, wounded, or disoriented GIs. To this day, in World War II, the American High Command still has no faith in the use of war dogs. It'll actually take a club, a civilian club, named Dogs for Defense, to sort of I don't want to say embarrass the military, but sort of nudge the high command into the use of war dogs. This group, and they're real dog lovers, they go all over the nation, visit families, and seek the donation of the family pet for the war effort. Anybody here old enough to remember that term, the war effort? How about for the duration? You know? Okay. So at any rate, um, the, the families would be promised that if the dog survives the war, and if it is reasonably possible, he will be returned to its rightful owner. And you know, honorably, to the extent possible, that promise was indeed kept. Now the club, Dogs for Defense, they sought two breeds in particular. They wanted Doberman Pinchers, and they wanted German Shepherds. Okay? Then the club trains those dogs at their own expense. After they've trained them for war purposes, they then put on a demonstration for the brass, for the high command, which is suitably enough impressed to do two things. Number one, for the rest of the war, for the duration of the war, the military will accept donations of war dogs from the club, Dogs for Defense. Number two, the U.S. Army will set up a dog training program, and during World War II, it was called, anybody know, anybody remember? It was the Canine Corps. Mm -hmm. It's called the Canine Corps during World War II. And they will train their own war dogs. And so we will use war dogs during the war from both sources, the club and, and the Army's own training program. The first dog units go overseas in March of 1944. A little late in the game, but not too late. A few will go to Europe, but most of them will go to the Pacific. Now, if you remember the Pacific campaign, this was the island hopping campaign where we had General MacArthur going through the southwest Pacific, ending up at the Philippines, and meanwhile Admiral Nimitz and the 3rd Fleet and 5th Fleet, which were the same fleet, little secret, we fooled the Japanese. It was actually the same fleet. And when Admiral uh, Halsey commanded, it was known as the third. And when Admiral Spruance commanded, it was the fifth. And they island hopped across the Central Pacific to the doorstep of Japan at Okinawa. And these islands, they were mostly jungle, teeming, fetid, steaming, hot jungles. Now, folks, no place is a good place to fight a war, don't get me wrong. But the guys that fought in the Pacific, and I remember as a kid, these, these were my heroes, listening to their stories, would tell stories of, of getting these lifetime uh, jungle rot diseases. And, and at one point, <clears throat> our Army uh, and Marine physicians and surgeons were throwing their hands up in frustration and exclaiming, Good Lord, we're losing more men to snake bite. 
than we are to Japanese bullets. I mean, and the malaria, and, and it was just horrible places. And in, in these thick, thick jungles, the Japanese were able to utilize their very excellent stealth skills. And they would, at times, outflank our marine units and sometimes surround them and early in the war annihilate them. Well, once the marines got dogs, that will never happen again. After the war, the United States Marine Corps issues a bulletin stating that no marine unit with a dog was ever again caught in a surprise ambush. Wow. However, there's a little bit of a learning curve here, folks. Remember, we're pretty new at this game, right? World War II is the first time we're officially using war dogs. And what is the dog's natural alarm mechanism? The bark. Thank you, the bark. So the dog's afraid or he wants to open it up. Arf, arf, he barks. So the first time, you know, our guys encounter the enemy with the dogs, the dog sounds off. Good, because we know the enemy's at hand. Bad, because the enemy knows we're at hand. So this requires some retraining. And what they did during World War II, today it's a little different, but during World War II, our dogs, our war dogs, and they called them that at the time, our war dogs were trained to silently alert their handler by pressing its body, the dog, pressing its body against the handler's leg so hard it almost knocked the handler over. There's no way the handler was going to miss that alert. Okay? And then the handler would notify the unit the direction in which the dog was pointing. And that's, that's where the enemy was. And they were, they were a wonderful, wonderful help in, in that environment. And I wanted to, this picture, I, I'd like to think, and I don't want to quite send it around yet, but this picture demonstrates, look at that, that thick uh, vegetation there. I mean, this poor Marine is having trouble getting his Doberman through it. It's, it's so thick. Well, early on, the Marines do use Dobermans, and, and I'll, I'll show you this. This is a picture, I think this is on uh, Guam or Saipan, and they are using Doberman pictures. Unfortunately, they find the beautiful Dobies to be just a little bit too high strung for the chaos, the noise, the confusion of combat. And so they will switch to German Shepherds and they, they will have much more satisfactory results. Okay. Now, during World War II, 20,000 dogs in America will enter war dog training programs, either our military or the club, the Dogs for Defense. 10,000 complete training and enter military service. Of the 10,000 dogs, only 10% go overseas. People are usually pretty startled by that. 90% of our war dogs stay right here in the continental United States. Why? Well, we were particularly concerned about Germany. Early in the war, the infamous German propaganda minister, anybody know? Joseph Goebbels, got on the radio, there's no TV in those days, got on the radio, and he shouted out at Americans, America, the fifth column is coming. Remember the fifth column? The fifth column, the saboteurs. We will come to America and we will destroy your forts and we will destroy your reservoirs and your electric generating stations and your railroad yards and everything that you need to make war, we will destroy. And we took it seriously. And it's a good thing we did. Three times, Germany, totally forgotten today, three times Germany lands sabotage teams on our shores. June 12, 1942, U-boat U-202 lands a four-man team off of Amagansett, Long Island. These four guys slash ashore, and do you know how they got into New York City? They rode the Long Island Railroad. <laughs> got on the train, rode into the city. A week later, June 16, 1942, U-485 uh, drops four guys off of, I, can, I always have trouble pronouncing this, Ponta Vedra Beach, just below Jacksonville, Florida. Anybody? Know that area? Am I pronouncing yeah. it right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, it's, okay, so that's where they drop four more guys. Those four make their way to Cincinnati. And in the. the Long Island, really. yeah. No, they didn't do that. <laughs> they rode other trains, but not that. Yeah, right? 
And in the fall of 1944, Germany drops a two-man team off of U-1230, 1230. Uh, and those two guys were supposed to find out about the Manhattan Project. Yeah. And what was the Manhattan Project? Atomic bomb. Atomic bomb Project. Lots of luck with that. We yeah. didn't even know much about it, much less, you know, their spies were going to learn. But anyway, in all cases, these guys were caught pretty quickly, mainly because of the first eight, two guys turned the mission over to the FBI. They had been treated badly by the Nazis. Actually, been tortured. Imagine they sent guys, two guys had been tortured by the Nazis. So they actually hated the Nazis. So when they got here, they, they turned, turned in their mission to the... And you know what, folks? I don't have time to go into it, but they had a heck of a time. The FBI thought they were crackpots. The FBI threw them out of their offices three times before they finally believed it. The only way they believed it is that one of the saboteurs went in with a satchel and dumped two hundred eighty-four thousand dollars in cash on the desk of the FBI agent in charge in Washington, and then the guy thought, "Oh, whoa, whoa, this is because they've been they literally have been thrown out three times." The FBI said, "You crackpots, will you stop bothering us with this stuff?" You know, so um, th six of the first eight were electrocuted. They, they were, and the two that turned in the mission uh, received life sentences, and after the war. President Truman in 1947 just sent them back to Germany, and they were not welcome. Oh. It was a, they lived a very bad life out there, because oh. back home in Germany, they were looked upon as traitors who cost the lives of six of their comrades. It was a very, this is a whole, like I said, a whole other story. I didn't mean to get too deeply into it. But at any rate, the Coast Guard, the United States Coast Guard, will use 3,174 war dogs to guard the coastline, coastlines of America. And I'd like to just mention this to you. Imagine being a Coast Guardsman in 1942, when, the, when those guys landed. Okay? They didn't have dogs yet. Folks, they didn't even have sidearms or rifles. All they had was a flashlight. They were assigned one mile of beach, and each Coast Guardsman, all by himself, I get scared just thinking of this, walked his mile. Beach, the ocean roaring here, and whatever's black land over here, and back and forth all night. He's doing this with a flashlight, <laughs> and that's what happened when the first group landed. They literally, I'm saying, ran into the coast. They knocked them down in the dark, and the, the guy that was the guy that was thankfully didn't like the Nazis stuffed money in the guy's pocket, two hundred bucks. And told the coast, to shut up, get out of here. He was lucky he didn't pull out a Luger, and, yeah. see? But, uh, and the, the, that Coast Guardsman ran back to, to the, uh, his headquarters and reported what had happened. But imagine, imagine if you were a Coast imagine that. One mile of beach, uh, each guy, all by himself, all night long. I often thought, that's got to be one of the scariest jobs in the world. And so <clears throat> that was the, the dog situation during World War II, and, and they acquitted themselves beautifully. Korea. In Korea, we will use 1,500 war dogs. And in Korea, the fear factor is greatly in play. For some reason, the Chinese communists and the North Koreans were deathly afraid of our dogs. And so they develop a policy of aiming at the dogs first before they shoot at the humans. Now, if you remember Korea, Korea, June 25, 1950 to what was it, July 27, 1953, was a stale, it was a back and forth across the 30th parallel. There's a lot of stalemates there. And, and just like World War I, we had all these elaborate trench systems. And at night, each side would hunker down. And then there'd be a wide swath of land between the two sides called no man's land. And every night, the Chinese communists would set up these loudspeakers. And all night long, they would broadcast propaganda across no man's land. And they did it for two reasons. Number one, to demoralize our guys, which was an utter failure because our guys laughed at their propaganda. It was, you know, it was fool foolish. Number two, to try to disturb our guys' sleep patterns, which they were more successful at. But anyway, <clears throat> give you an idea of how much our dogs were on their minds from time to time. This was the message the Chinese communists broadcast in the dark across no man's land. Yankee, take your dog and go home. <laughs> they did not like our dogs. 
In Vietnam, we will use 4,000 war dogs. And in Vietnam, our dogs are used very much as they were in the Pacific in World War II. Remember Vietnam in many parts was heavily jungle. And the Viet Cong and the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, were very skillful at particularly nasty booby traps. And one of their favorite booby traps, traps was something called the punji pit. Now these dirt trails in the jungles of Vietnam are wide enough to accommodate maybe one or two guys side by side. And so the Viet Cong would dig a hole in the middle of the trail. Okay? And then they would take bamboo stakes and they would sharpen each end to a razor's edge. And then they'd drive these bamboo stakes straight down into the ground until those straight edges are pointing straight up maybe three, four inches below the existing soil. And then they'd cover the punji pit with shrubs, brush, leaves, grass, anything to mask the pit, but not hold up the weight of a man. So now as our guys come down the trail, they would fall into these pits, and they would get cut to ribbons by these punji stakes. But, folks, now that wasn't bad enough for the Viet Cong. They had to make it the worst possible scenario. So they took cow manure and smeared the ends of those punji stakes with cow manure. So now our guys not only got cut to ribbons, but they would pick up the most wicked, god-awful infections imaginable. Believe it or not, bless our noble canines, believe it or not, we were able to train some of our war dogs to detect the absence of earth. How cool is that? They were able to train our dogs to go down uh, uh, leading a patrol. We'd send them ahead of a patrol, and the dog would get right to the bungee, in front of the bungee pit and alert. There's no ground there. There's no ground there, guys. You know? And so those wonderful dogs will have saved numerous American lives and limbs by detecting those punji pits. In Vietnam, 263 dog handlers will give their lives for their country, and 500 of our war dogs will give their lives for their country. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, the number one use of our war dogs, as I mentioned before, was in explosives detection. And I thank you. And I do have lists up here of my speeches, if anybody would like any. If you know anybody that would like a speaker, please take my list. I have 10 different speeches, and I'd be glad to, to go. Thank you so much. We do have refreshments outside, but before we do that, are there questions for Rob? Yes. Who was the most famous dog? Oh, I, I want to keep it a secret. Do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to know? Whisper it to me. All right. Let, let's see. What? Anybody got any ideas? Rin Tin. Yes. Rin Tin. Came out of World War One. He was a pup. He was a pup, and his handler found him in France. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was, on, he was a, actually a member of the Air Corps, and he was on a ground assignment, and he found this beautiful. Uh, he found the mama and and uh, six, five or six starving pups. Mm -hmm. And they weren't even weaned, their eyes weren't open yet. And he rescued them and brought them back, and that's where Rin Tin Tin came from. We, we owned wow. one, eighth the, generation. Is that right? Yeah. One of Rini's relatives? Beautiful. Oh, dog. gosh. With How did they get the name? Awesome. A Rin Tin Tin came from a French thing, so, uh, some sort of a book. And I don't know the exact detail, but there was a book about Rin Tin Tin. Yeah, some, Tin Tin, Tin was it? Yeah, something of that nature. And um, I will give a little bit away here. Rinny, Rin Tin Tin, was arguably the most brilliant dog actor in history. He could do any stunt at all. Whatever, whatever the director wanted, the handler, the, the owner would direct him, and Rin Tin Tin could do everything. Rin Tin Tin has 47, he sires 47 pups. And so when Rin Tin Tin dies in 1933, they star Rin Tin Tin Jr. in the movies. Okay? Poor Jr. A box of rocks. <laughs> a box of rocks. They they had you ready for this? Whenever they used Rin Tin Tin Jr. in a movie, they had to use seven different German shepherds. <laughs> One that could jump over objects, another who could attack, another, you know, get the picture. Whereas Rinny Sr. <coughs> did it all. 
but all Rennie Sr. was, boy, if you think uh, some of these stars, you know, you hear about these stars that are not nice people. Ren Tin Tin was not nice. <laughs> he would haul off and bite anybody on the set for any reason at all. He just bit anybody. He didn't care. Just took it as my belt. D director, bite the director. He, he didn't care the star. It was, he was just, Rennie was, uh, and he knew it. He knew that he was so bad, he saved Warner Brothers. And, and he knew that H.B. Warner would never get rid of him. One time the director got bitten and went crying to H.B. H.B. says, oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I, I, it's okay. God, we're going to bandage you up, and then we're going to get a new director. <laughs> and, 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 and I look at Warner, and, and H.B. says, what do you think? You say, I get directors all day long. There's only one Rin Tin Tin. And his, are the only, his movies were the only movies making money for Warner Brothers. He literally saved the studio year after year. They called him the mortgage lifter. And <laughs> Tim was the mortgage lifter. He paid them. He paid the freight every year. No joke. This guy. Oh, what a dog! Yeah. So, so other he, questions? Yes. yes. Is, is there a figure of like percentage of troops that actually use a dog, like in war today? It's very small percentage. Right. Or no, in, in terms of how who, who the handlers are, or no, so many no, per how unit many troops. Have dogs? Yeah, you know, the percentage of right. trips having dogs. Not a huge percentage. I mean, obviously, right? Uh, I thought you were referring to who or who the handlers are. That's an interesting. That's an interesting thing too. You know, you have to show a whole aptitude. Um, and I've read uh, issues where there were dog handlers in Iraq and Afghanistan that literally hated their dog and their dog hated them. Oh, but they did what they had to do. And then mo mostly, mostly they loved each other. And mostly when the dog retired, the handler would, would adopt the dog. Yes. But there are cases that they, they hated each other. <laughs> but, but they did what they had to do. You know, and, and, and they always try to emphasize the fact that the dog was a soldier. Just like the police, right? The police always, that's a police, that's a, he's a police or she's a policeman. Somebody else. There was yeah. a question for yeah. right uh, Okay. Uh, dogs were used, also horses were used in, oh, even way back in the Mexican War, yeah. mules, but um, in World War II, mm -hmm. they had a lot of horses mm -hmm. used, but are there any other animals that were used? Um, donkeys or, or, or that. Mules? Yeah, mules. It, 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 Germany was a huge uh, user of, of horses, if I may say it that way. When they invaded Russia, Operation Barbarossa, June 22, 1941, they went into Russia with 720,000 horses. Wow. The, 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 I mean, which is startling on one hand, but also, doesn't it tell you something? It tells you they're not quite as mechanized as we, we, we tend to think of their lightning, their blitzkrieg, you know, and all their... Me and Germany introduced the world to combined arms. They introduced the world to this business of coming in with ground troops doing this, airplanes doing that, tanks doing, you know what I mean, so inter, interconnected and supporting each other, which we call combined arms. They call it Blitzkrieg. And you think of that as, you know, you think of Germany as having this, which they did, uh, a quite, quite a magnificent war machine, if I can use that word, which is probably a bad choice, but they had quite a war machine. But the fact that they still relied on that many horses to go into Russia, isn't that, isn't that, to me, that always struck me as, wow, and they weren't quite as mechanized as we, as we thought. We did have a program on the use of horses, horses. in the military, and how many, uh, I mean, particularly in World War I, and the amount of slaughter of horses was just absolutely abominable. That's, that's one of our videos from, I think, about a year or two years ago. If there's a final question, before it looks like we're about ready to adjourn. I want to thank Paul Niederkorn, by the way, for stepping in for David Miller, who couldn't be here this evening, who is filming our program. So thank you, Paul. And thank you, Ron, for yet again sharing with us some really great information. Very entertaining. So welcome, everybody, outside. We have uh, refreshments.